That is surprising. Wow. Me too. Um, also number three, it's all of my rankings. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Listography. Jason, Joe, and Krams are here. And we are kicking off Counting Crows Week, a band that we didn't really touch on for a very long time. And now all of a sudden, we're in the 90s on our Albums of the Year series, talking about them all the time. And we thought it would be a good time to uh, keep that going and just cover their whole discography here. Seven albums, one of which is an album of covers. Not that many to rank. I guess we'll get into it. What do you guys think about Counting Crows? I like them. I made my 93 list. After doing this, I like to redo my 96 list and it kind of surprised me i think i had the wrong idea about two of their albums so this was an eye-opening experience for me i think they're very consistent i don't think they really have a bad album at least all of their original albums are all really strong adam duritz i think he's a great songwriter i think the band's constantly interesting they're well produced and the recordings, you know, all their instruments are just immaculately done. You know, they have um, David Immergluck. I think, you know, their ability to add all these different instruments into each one of their songs really helps. It's not just acoustic guitar, it's not just electric guitar. There's mandolins and piano and tons of other stuff, slide guitar, steel, uh, lap steel guitar. And I think that's maybe what I like most about them is just their sort of multi-instrumental experience. It's, it's each song is different and it just kind of keeps you guessing a little bit where they're going to go. They cover a lot of styles really well. And I think they're a really great band. One of the stronger 90s alternative, whatever you want to classify them as. Just a, a very good band in general. Yeah, it took a lot of the words right out of my mouth. I would probably go as far to say that the strength is the band and the accompaniment. I think Duritz is a bit overrated as a songwriter, um, which I think is evident in the later albums because I don't really think he's doing anything new. I don't really think he grows that much as a writer. I think he even kind of starts to parody himself a little bit and become that mockery that people might think of him. But I don't think he's, I probably made it seem worse than I actually think he is. I think he's really good. I just... Um, lately, we've been little, using that term one trick pony a lot. I wouldn't say he's a one trick pony, but I would definitely say that he's very concentrated with his style and never really gets out of that. Um, but definitely the quality of the songwriting is all, all over the first four albums, I would say. I think the last three albums, and one of them is a covers album, but not quite on the same level for me. So I think there's two great albums, one good album, and the rest are kind of in the mid-range. But even on some of the albums I'm not crazy about, there's usually a song or some moments that really strike chords. He's really good at getting deep inside your soul as a listener at times um, and being really um, communicative and just really hits the heartstrings quite a bit. But Let's turn it over to Jason, who is the biggest of the, the Counting Crows fans and has been for a while. Yeah, I th I'm a huge Counting Crows fan. I got August and Everything After pretty much when it came out. I would have been in like fourth grade probably. So I've been listening, listening to them since I was really young. Love them a lot. But I do agree with Cram. I think the later albums aren't on the same level as the earlier ones. But I think the first four are incredible. Adam Doritz's writing on those records is great, but I also agree that the, the main strength of the band is the band itself. I think they're all great players. And I think, you know, maybe part of the decline on the later records is the band. You know, you get, you get a different drummer. Um, the bass player quit sometime after the Hard Candy record, I think, or maybe right after Saturday Nights, somewhere in there. And now they have a different bass player. So there's been some personnel changes. That rhythm section of Matt Malley and Ben Mize is one of the most underrated ever. They're so good. They're both incredible players. So, yeah, we'll get into more about the specifics of the of the different players and, and things like that when we get into the album by album. But uh, let's do that. Who wants to start? I'll start. I'll, I'll try to keep it brief because I know you guys really like Aaron Crows a little bit more than me, maybe? I mean, okay, yeah. Probably a uh, little bit. A little bit. We'll say a little bit. So I won't ruin everything for y'all. 
I'll let you all speak. For me, I think clearly the weakest album is the Underwater Sunshine cover album. I don't think it's bad, but there's some sort of, it's, it's pretty hit or miss. I think it's a really cool track list. I really like sort of the diversity of stuff they're going for. Uh, you got, you know, Big Star and Bob Dylan and Graham Parsons, uh, Travis, uh, Fairport Convention. So really cool kind of set list, but I think the quality kind of varies pretty heavily. I think the cover of Amy uh, by Pure Prairie League is pretty bad, especially compared to the original. But uh, the Ooh La La Faces cover is pretty good, and they don't change things up too much. You know, there's not... You know, it's all these songs kind of in the style of Counting Crows. They don't really go outside the box. But I think some of the stuff, maybe the uh, lesser known stuff works a little bit better for me than the sort of big hits like Amy. But it's, uh, it's good. It's fine. It's a cover album. We always say every band has these. And I, I had no idea they had this album at all, but it's fine. Um, like Jason, I knew all seven of these records going in. Um, and so really just needed a bit of a refresher, mostly on the newest three. But my number seven is Saturday Nights and Sunday Mornings. Um, I think a lot of times Counting Crows are unfairly just kind of thrust into that adult alternative sort of genre of the mid 90s. But I thought that they always outperformed and outclassed and outwrote pretty much everyone else in that pack. Except on this one, I think they aren't nearly good enough. And this does kind of sound like a very generic adult alternative record to me at times. Split in half the first one about Saturday nights, second half about Sunday mornings, the first half kind of rocking and upbeat in the second half much more somber like you're kind of just sitting and reflecting over like a Americana breakfast but um you know it has a really raw and rustic sound which doesn't serve anything any good for me and I think the playing kind of gets lost here and unfortunately this one has some of the more dreadful lyrics that he's put together it definitely sounds by now that he's like if you think you hear like a line or a stanza that you've heard in a Counting Crows song before it's it kind of feels that way a lot where he's describing things like scenes from movies. I think he uses the phrase walking on a tightrope quite a bit, which I feel like I've heard a lot. Um, so it's getting a little messy. Some of the harder stuff, faster stuff too, I, it doesn't even feel like he's really keeping up, like he overwrote the lyrics and it's not really letting the song breathe and just sounds kind of cluttered. But there is some decent stuff on here. I think Washington Square is probably the best song on here. There's also some really killer guitar on the song, Insignificant, but some bad songs too. I really don't like Sundays or Los Angeles. So this one is kind of just kind of plain and generic and forgettable for me, not terrible. And I actually even kind of like the idea of splitting the album in half, but the problem is like, None of the Saturday nights are that much fun to think that you'd even really need to reflect the next day and talk about them, even though, you know, that's what white people do if they go out drinking no matter what. So it's, yeah, it's, it's pretty lousy, but, you know, they've got much better stuff. Saturday nights and Sunday morning, number seven. All right. I uh, can't say I really disagree with either of those picks that much, and I agree with most of what both of you said, but I am with Joe. I've got Underwater Sunshine or what we did on our summer vacation at the bottom at number seven. I agree pretty much with what he said. I don't have a whole lot more to add. I agree it's an awesome selection of songs. And even though a lot of their versions of the songs aren't that great, I think you know if, if it leads some Counting Crows fans that aren't as well versed in all of these other bands to some of that music, then it's and it's a worthwhile effort, I guess. Um, but that's really the only, you know, standout thing about it. The playing's not that great. Some of the so some of the covers are decent. Some are just okay. There's a few that are train wrecks. I think the cover of Start Again by Teenage Fan Club is awful. So yeah, it's hit or miss. And, you know, it's fine. It's a covers album. Like Joe said, I agree with most of his commentary. So I'll leave it at that. Alrighty, moving on. Um, six and five. I really and i mean it's flip a coin for me i think they're both pretty good actually it sounds like i like saturday nights 
Sunday mornings a little bit more than Cramser does. Um, but in my rankings, I have somewhere under Wonderland at number six, Palisades Park. I was reading some of the critical reviews and people do kind of compare Duritz to Springsteen sometimes. And I never really got that too much until I listened to Palisades Park, which is like just completely Springsteen. It's completely early Springsteen. It's kind of scary, actually. I sort of, is this like a cover or something? That one. And then he jumps to Earthquake Driver, which is like pure Paul Simon. So he's kind of, I don't know if he's branching out at all, but those two to lead off the album are interesting choices. Then it kind of gets back into normal Counting Crows territory, which is good. Um, I mean, I really don't have any negatives about this album i think maybe i just you know i don't think i've heard it before we did this i kind of forgot about the counting crows in the mid 2010s but it's a good album i like scarecrow i think it's a great verse cover up the sun has a nice like country little kind of gets into bluegrass uh, which i really like durance's lyrics are sort of you know i kind of feel on this album it's sort of a little bit like what Crams are was talking about on Saturday nights and Sunday mornings. It's it's Adam Duritz, but it's like Adam Duritz trying to be Adam Duritz from the 90s a little bit to me, maybe a little bit too much uh, sometimes. But other than that, I, I think it's a pretty good album. Definitely kind of surprising at how good that they still sound 20 years after their debut. It's, it's in six for now. It could move up later. Probably need to spend a little more time with it, but I liked it a lot. So number six, Somewhere Under Wonderland has a terrible cover. That really kind of, I kind of, <laughs> that probably turned me off when I saw it originally in 2014. I was like, I'm not, I'm not dealing with this. This is a terrible cover. So like Springsteen, bad covers sometimes, but sorry. Uh, my number six is Underwater Sunshine or What We Did on Summer Vacation. Uh, first things first, what a stupid name for an album. I don't, I don't just, sometimes he's just so contrived and lame with his lyrics, but that's also sometimes just what you kind of love about him. He's unapologetic about who he is. Let me address you saying that he sounds like Springsteen. Um, I never got that at all. I have, like you read, a bunch of different singers and songwriters that people say that, you know, he's not quite a carbon copy of, but sometimes doing an imitation of Van Morrison or this or that. And I have never really got that about Adam Duritz. I think he's just himself, obviously coming 20, 30 years after classic rock and all these influences, you're going to get influences as with anybody by this time. But I've never really bought into the fact that he's like this, like that. I think he's just his own thing, um, which is usually very good, sometimes not so good. Um, but for this album, I, I actually, my favorite on it is Start Again. So I'm completely against Jason here. Obviously, I think they're very different. But I do think coming after Saturday Nights, where I think that is easily the worst the band has ever sounded. This one, I think they start to find their footing a little bit more. They're back to just like that Americana, Middle America bar rock band. Really nice vibe, reflective, steady. You know, nothing that you're going to like want to want to hear at a Counting Crows concert. Be like, oh man, I need to hear their cover of Amy. But I think it was a nice step for them to take because I think um, the album after this is a really nice kind of comeback for them. And I think this kind of sets it up for that. Yeah, I mean, nothing great. A, lot, a bunch of these I don't really know the originals of. But I think it's pretty pleasant listen, definitely better than Saturday Nights. So that's my number six. All right. My number six is Saturday Nights and Sunday Mornings. Uh, like Cram said, it's divided between these electric songs and more acoustic songs on the back half. Gil Norton produced most of the Saturday Night tracks and Brian Zeck did the acoustic stuff for the most part. And I just think this concept never works. A lot of artists have tried it. I think it's a horrible idea and a way to sequence a record. And also on this record, you know, on the first four Counting Crows records, I think they're like one of the best bands ever at like playing for the songs. All the parts really work together. You know, the drums will be so locked in with the lyrics and like little things will accent words. And here they feel like shackled by this concept where like they feel like they have to add these electric guitars to these songs that don't really need to be that heavy or that rocking. 
and vice versa. Maybe some of the slower songs could have used a little more of that. It just feels like they're forcing the arrangements on the songs to fit into this concept. Also, I don't think the mix on this is that great. I think it's kind of mid-rangey, and Adam's voice sounds really thin on this record. I don't think he sounds that good on it. I do like some of the songs on it, though. Los Angeles is one of my more favorite songs on it, even though Cram listed it as one of his lesser favorite. Um, I think Cowboys is cool. When I Dream of Michelangelo is great. But, you know, their first four records are so, so solid. And there's a bunch of songs on this record that don't work that well. So number six for me. It is my number five. And like I said, it's pretty much interchangeable in my mind with Somewhere Under Wonderland. I think maybe, you know, I listen to these in order from the August and everything after on. And sort of, you know, the first four albums are pretty similar in the way they sound. So maybe it was just the kind of different style. You know, you kind of get that heavier guitar right off the bat in 1492. And the the whole first, you know, the Saturday night section is much heavier, I think, than their normal output, which maybe it's just because it's different and I was kind of looking for something new, I elevated it. But I really like the the Saturday nights part. Uh, I like Los Angeles a lot, which actually has a, I don't know if Jason knew this because he didn't mention it. You knew it, of course. Yeah, Ryan Adams has a a co-writing credit on that one and you know I, I like I, I think I just like the sound of it I like the heaviness the Sunday mornings I think is a little less successful like Jason said that the whole concept of doing like a one theme and then another theme never really works out you know if, if they just sort of sandwich it together where you have a harder softer harder softer something like that I think it'd be a little more successful because you kind of get into a rut in the second half after when I do with Michelangelo of just sort of like, okay, this is kind of the same song. Give me something else. But I think in general, it's, it's pretty good to quote Tom Petty. I don't hear a single. I think that was maybe one of the problems. Their first four albums, you know, you have these songs that are just so like radio ready, you know, you just want to hear it on the radio. And this one's not, you know, there's, there's nothing quite like that. So I guess it, it could be sort of a disappointment following those four. But uh, I think it's pretty good. I don't know. It's, it's a Counting Crows album. I think they're all pretty good. So. Well said. It is a Counting Crows album. Um, if you if you had to pick a single off of it, what would you pick? Like if you were forced, both of you, if they, if they were like, forced. what's their single going to be? You, ca- you Can't Count on Me was a decent single for them. I think it charted okay. I heard it on the radio a bunch. I think that's a good single. Yeah, it was the lead commercial single. I would probably say that. I mean, I, I think I like Los Angeles the best, maybe insignificant, but there's nothing quite, you know, there's no Mr. Jones or Hanging Around or American Girls on this one. It's a little less sort of radio ready, I think. Not that that's a bad thing necessarily. but No, it's not a bad no. thing, but I think the reason why nothing jumps out is because nothing jumps out because I don't think it ever really gets into the category of their best stuff. All right, my number five is, I think, a pretty darn good album. We keep kind of classing these albums like the first four, and the first four are the best, um, which it seems like we're all going to be at, but I do think that Somewhere Under Wonderland is pretty good and a nice step out of a couple of clunkers well one clunker and then one just kind of safe cover album palisades park really awesome opener big and epic earthquake driver really cool follow-up to it this one is just seems like it's like jason was saying like they were really forcing stuff on saturday night sunday mornings and then you know this one comes a lot more naturally i think both in the playing and with just kind of it's his most like organic invitation into like his head space in a while it's not as whiny and as like ripe and vile with the desperation and self-pity that a lot of the earlier stuff is but you know it is still a counting crows album so you do get that throughout it does feel kind of nice and deliberate and nostalgic and detailed without doing kind of his storytelling narrative vibes that he used to almost exclusively do in the first part of Counting Crows. But yeah, I definitely think this is just a nice collection of good songs. He might be playing it safe a little bit, but I think those two songs I mentioned are great. I think God of Ocean Tides is really good. So is Scarecrow. I do think after Scarecrow, it kind of 
dips a little bit, but it's not an album that if you don't like Counting Crows, it's going to like win you over. It's got, it's very Counting Crowsy. Sometimes just inserts adjectives and stuff that just paint the picture of Counting Crows life. Like I think he talks about Blue Slipwaite's shoes on some guy, talks about Elvis, Jackie O. I don't know what Johnny Appleseed is doing, but it's a, uh, it's pretty good. And I think kind of back to basics, never followed up on this, but it would have been interesting because it seemed like they were getting their footing back a little bit. Doesn't have the upper echelon of their talent like the first four does, but I do think it was a step in the right direction at the time. So somewhere under Wonderland is my number five. Yep. It's also my number five. After the previous, you know, two records were pretty big disappointments for me. I didn't pay a ton of attention to this one when it came out. I did get it actually have it on vinyl and I listened to it a couple times and I thought that it was decent. I, I recognized that it was a step up from the two that came before, but at that time I just wasn't super into Counting Crows and I didn't listen to it a ton and probably didn't give it enough attention. Revisiting it now, I, I really think it's you know significantly better than the two before it. Not quite the same level as their first four. I think it's a, an easy choice to put at number five. I think it's definitely better than the two below it and definitely worse than the four above it. But I think it's really solid, a good late period record for them. Brian Deck, who produced the second half of Saturday Night, Sunday Mornings, is back and produces this. And it seemed for a while he was working with all, all of my favorite bands. He was, you know, on a real hot streak. Like Cram said, Palisades Park is probably the standout. and even though I don't know about the lyrics to Johnny Appleseed's Lament, I think the guitar work on that track is awesome. I think it's really, really good. A, a real highlight of the record for me. Uh, Somewhere Under Wonderland is number five. All right, now we're moving on to the uh, the big four. Uh, we all have these four albums in our top four. And really, it's just going to come down to what order we drop them in. For moi, I have Hard Candy at number four, which I bet everybody has it at number four. It's a good album. Hard Candy, the song. I start, I like American Girls. It's sort of that fun, hanging around flavor, uh, you know, up-tempo, built for the radio. And then after that, uh, I like Cheryl Crow. I will say that on the backing vocals for American Girls. I really like that sort of style. I think it really fits with the band, having her um in the choruses and everything i don't know it sort of seems like he's you know we were talking about how dirt sometimes maybe parodies himself a little bit i think on this one he gets a little bit into the duritisms a little too much it doesn't seem quite as sharp or as fresh there's not a ton of growth happening you know these first four kind of you know not there's nothing wildly unexpected anywhere lots of good songs but it kind of feels like i've heard them before uh, i do like butterfly in reverse and miami's pretty darn good i think the biggest problem with this album of course is big yellow taxi just a horrible horrible cover one of the worst covers i think i've ever heard and that definitely holds it back a little bit for me that wasn't that wasn't initially on the record. That was added as a like a hidden track later on. It's a hidden track, but still, you're right. <laughs> okay. If I guess in the original pressings, if it wasn't on there, I won't include it from the album. It still stays at number four. No, I think it is on the original release, just as a hidden track. Like it was never not on the album, right? But it, it's yeah, it's, it's a hidden track, and Vanessa Carlton's not on it originally. Okay. So it's not quite as bad, but still, that song alone is enough. No, no, it never had a chance of being number three. I think it's a solid fourth. Good album. Don't get me wrong. Uh, maybe a little too much yelping. That's one of the notes I wrote down uh, from Duritz. But other than that, good album. I think um, probably doesn't get the respect it deserves because everyone associates it with Big Yellow Taxi. But, uh, you know. It's a, it's a very good Counting Crows album, and that's all I got. I also have Hard Candy at number four. Joe is correct. However, I think Jason has This Desert Life at number four. So I don't think all of us do. We'll see. Ooh. All right. Joe's right. Um, very aptly named. The album is like sucking on a piece of hard candy. It's really sweet and enjoyable, but then it just kind of dissolves away and leaves you actually wanting a meal. 
um, because it's a really good album, but it's not a great album. It's definitely not a great Counting Crows album. Joe said it perfectly when he does everything so well on the first two, and then, but never grows out of it, never really gets like a, even like, even like the slightest little creativity, like doesn't really explore much outside of that. So it's not even like, you can't even say that these songs and the talent isn't as good as the first two. It's just stale and not quite as fresh. Still really good, but because he doesn't really get out of that, you know, it, it doesn't really, if you're following the Counting Crows, doesn't really give you much more s stuff to grab onto than you already had. That said, I think it's really sharp and very radio friendly, but it is missing a punch. It's definitely missing those soul crushers too that are on some of the first couple albums it seems sort of like this is the album that the industry wanted them to make and they kind of knocked it out of the park like almost every song sounds like you could get radio time just the way it's constructed and performed i think hard candy is a good song i like american girls cheryl crow great that's sort of like the perfect demographic too to like just kind of put their stamp on where they fit into rock radio at the time um, I'm not crazy about Goodnight LA. I really hate the really corny guitar riff on If I Could Give All My Love. Butterfly in Reverse, Miami, New Frontier, probably the middle of the album is my favorite in it. And I really like how the album closes out, just hits the right notes. And even though I hate Big Yellow Taxi, I do think it was like smart commercially to just kind of put that on at the end. And again, it's got that terrible early 2000s production, which is our obviously our least favorite sound in rock history because we rip on it every chance we get you get it right off the bat for big yellow taxi but yeah i think there's a lot of really good stuff on this i think it is the easy choice for number four however so number four hard candy i also have hard candy at number four um you're right the production on uh, big yellow taxi is really bad but I think the production on the rest of the album is really good. So on the, I feel like their first three records, they had all these hits, but I don't feel like they were trying to write hits and they happened naturally. And on this record, you kind of see that trends and in the industry are like moving in different directions. And you can almost feel that they're thinking like, if we do what we normally do, we're not going to have a hit this time. So we need to try to be poppy. This is like a conscious effort to be a little poppier, I think, on this record, um, which is fine. I think they sort of walk the line very well between intentionally trying to be commercial and not abandoning their sound. I think it's uh, pretty masterfully done as far as that goes. I think this record is a little less cohesive than their first three records. It's a little bit all over the place. I don't think New Frontier really fits in with that sort of new wavy synth line. And there's some other tracks where I feel like you could probably trim this down by three or four songs and make it just as good as the first three. But the good stuff here is really, really good. Good Time is amazing. I love the guitar tone on it. One of my favorite guitar solos ever. The groove is really cool between the drum and the bass on that. Miami's great. Up All Night is awesome. I think Holiday in Spain's a really good piano ballad. Would have been a great way to close out the album if uh, Big Yellow Taxi wasn't there. I think it's really, really strong, and I think it's really, really underrated. I think Joe's right that it gets sort of associated with B Big Yellow Taxi, and then you also had um, Accidentally in Love right after this on the Shrek soundtrack, and I think just their uh, maybe critical opinion was on the decline around this time. People you know, sort of just lumping them in with other less serious acts or, you know, less good acts but i think it's a, still a really strong record and um there's a lot of good material on it worth uh, revisiting it was unfair like they all of a sudden turned into like this sappy almost kid like fluff piece band with everyone knowing big yellow taxi with vanessa carlton and accidentally in love yeah and you're right the rest of the production on the album doesn't sound anything like big yellow taxi so it's weird that the song came out the way it did okay uh moving on to my number three i got and i'm gonna assume everyone has this in number three maybe not maybe not but uh this desert life is my third i really 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 love hanging around it's just such a fun song it has such a cool sound, like the piano and the bass are almost like following the lyrics. It's almost like a ragtime piano. The bass is just kind of real groove and everything about the song is fun. I love it. And then you go right into Miss Potter's Lullaby. It's about Monica Potter. 
And I, I, maybe I don't know the whole story. He wrote it like based on an imaginary version of her that he saw in like Con Air and, and uh, movies. And I don't know if it was like a shot at like, hey, I love you or like, or just like, hey, this is about an imaginary Monica Potter. Was it Con, her role in Con Air? I hope it is because we should also had a song about Nicolas Cage. That would have been awesome. N- yeah, Nicolas Cage's lullaby. Mr. Cage's lullaby. But it's a, a hell of a way to try and meet somebody if that was his intention. It's a great song, not just because I also love Monica Potter. And we hit the atmosphere is sort of like maybe the weakest track for me on the album, but then I think it picks up again. I really love All My Friends. Colorblind's real pretty. Cool kind of piano melody on that. Very sparse. I uh, really love the phased guitar on Wish I Was a Girl and Speedway, St. Robinson, this Cadillac Dream. I think pretty much everything's great other than, for some reason, I just do not like Amy Hit the Atmosphere. It's sort of like that parody style of Adam Durst that I was kind of alluding to on the other reviews, just like real sort of whiny and looking back at some of these critical reviews, which I always like to do. One guy said he's a classic solipsistic soul bearer who won't shut up about himself. And I can see that, you know, Adam Durrett's yowls and moans. But um, I think for the most part, other than Amy Hit the Atmosphere, I think it's nice and peppy for the most part. Just a, a good album. I also have This Desert Life at number three, although it wasn't as clear cut of a choice. I think it is just behind my number two thing, which isn't to take down my number two pick, but I think this one is criminally underrated. I think even the critics that give them a fair uh, share of credit usually say the first two are the best, but I really think this should be lumped in as a trio of amazing albums. I like every song on here quite a bit, what Jason was saying before about how the band usually does such a great job of serving the song, I think is really evident here because it might be their most musical album. And it kind of sounds like for the first time, the songs are written with the band in mind rather than just like Adam Duritz writes these songs and his band is so good that can, they can just back him up effortlessly and serve to the song. But now it really feels like they're a part of the song and it's written for the band. Um, really catchy choruses. Still a lot of mopiness, but doesn't seem quite as lonely, maybe because it has that richer band sound to me. And I think this might be Adam's best vocal performance, mainly because he's holding back a little more than he did in the first two and kind of letting the songs breathe, letting the band do a little bit of the work. Um, and compared to the first two, it's getting more into the pop rock sort of arena here which they'll really go for in hard candy like we talked about not a lot to complain about a couple little things like customer studio stuff i'm not crazy about like the guitar sound and i wish i was a girl really don't like kid things on it as the hidden track at the end it seems to be their achilles heel is trying to put something weird and cool in the hidden ending of these albums and it doesn't work for me at all but yeah all of the songs are great i think it's got amazing balance from like the really nice upbeat openers with hanging around and then into mrs potter's lullaby which is a very quick seven minutes for me because you know it's just such a good rock and piano part i like amy hit the atmosphere i think colorblind comes at the most perfect time in the album like this nice somber piano beautiful song yeah i've got no complaints we're not up to 1999 yet in our album of the year list, but this probably will get some, you know, candidacy for me for, you know, we'll see what's, if it'll make the top five, but it'll definitely be considered. I think it's that good. This Desert Life. Also, my number three, This Desert Life. This one was produced by David Lowry and Dennis Herring. David Lowry was in uh, Camper Van Beethoven and he was in Cracker and... Dennis Herring did production for Throwing Muses and The Innocence Mission and The Ocean Blue. So kind of a different background for their producers to have. And I remember reading a long time ago that um, they were heavily inspired by Good Morning Spider, the Sparkle Horse album. And you can kind of hear that in the production, especially in the guitar tones. There's a lot of really different sounding guitars on this record. Almost every track has a different guitar tone and multiple different guitar tones, and they're all really cool and mixed really interestingly. So I think that's, you know, really 
probably the strength of the album is all these different textures that the pr production brings in. The songwriting is still really, really strong and sharp. I put it at number three, though, because I think for me, the first two records, almost every track on both of those records is like 10 out of 10 for me. And there's a few songs on this record that might be like eight out of tens or nine out of tens. So I still think it's really, really great. It will also get consideration for me in 1999, but just a, a few tracks that I don't like as much hanging around being one colorblind four days. I don't, I mean, I like those songs. They're still like eight out of tens, but you know, just, maybe just a tick weaker than everything else they had done to that point. Hanging around is an 11 out of 10, Jason. Won't hear another word. All right, well, here's where my big surprise lands. My number two is August and Everything After. It's a great album. It's really great. But it's not as great as I remembered in my head. And maybe I erred in putting it on my list in 93. I always thought it was my number one. So my number one is now Recovering the Satellites. And maybe I got some of the tracks mixed up in my head or something. I don't know. It was a great album. Round Here, great opener. Love Omaha, kind of country-ish uh, feel to it. You know, I think Mr. Jones is immaculately written, just fantastic in every way. I know people are probably tired of it because it's still played on the radio every 10 minutes. But I think it's one of those just timeless, great, simple, perfect songs. You know, ranking, another kind of peppy song, but also sad, but a fantastic melody. Love it. I think my biggest problem is four, five, six. Perfect Blue Buildings, Anna Begins, Time and Time Again, which Jason's shaking his head. Um, they're just a little too mopey for me. They're just kind of too Adam Duritzy. And sort of the same, I mean, Sullivan Street Ghost Train and Raining in Baltimore, maybe the same kind of thing. Um, I like them. It's a whole album. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, I know. That's what I was saying. I don't like this album as much as I remembered liking it. I still, I still think it's great. It's not quite as dynamic and sort of driving as I guess I had it in my head. Apparently, I was thinking of recovering the satellites because that's sort of that, you know, every song kind of, they shift a little bit to like an alternative band. Uh, it's more upbeat. It's less sort of soul searching. -y. You know, the, the band sounds richer and fuller on that one. A little thin sounding to me. Maybe I just don't like the acoustic sort of super low key uh, stuff on here as much as I remembered, but uh, still very good album. It's just not, maybe it's the production, maybe it's T-Bone that I don't like as much. I don't know, I know Jason normally doesn't like T-Bone Burnett, but I, I still feel like this will be his number one. But it's a good album. I love it a lot. August and everything after number two. All right, my number two is Recovering the Satellites. And it will get some attention from me for 96 album of the year, which will be out Friday. Yeah, this album is great. It's quite different than the debut. Main difference is the heaviness and the tempo. It's more of a, like Joe said, an alternative rock record. You know, not entirely. There's still a lot of ballads all over it. And, you know, the not quite as self-absorbed as the first one, but it's still got, you know, the mopey, lonesome Adam Duritzy vibes. He's still whining, but he does it better than anyone. The only... I think there's just more standout songs on the debut that will give it my number one, but there's still some, so many amazing songs. If I had to nitpick this album a little bit, I'd say it's a little bit too long for me. I would also say there's a couple songs that kind of drag it. One of them is the opener catapult, which I'm not crazy about. Uh, I would have preferred just Angels of the Silence's opening. I also, I know everyone loves Long December, but I never have. It was probably the second Counting Crow song I ever heard in my life outside of Mr. Jones. And it's never stuck with me. It's one of those cases where it doesn't make sense that I don't like it that much, but I'm not crazy about it. Yeah, I think it's just a, a lot more like a little bit less self-pity and just more of just like more of a rock record to me. Um, and I kind of want more of the Duritzy, Counting Crows, mopiness of the original one. But 
This one has just like a really nice menagerie of tempos and skill sets. I think the guitar on this album is great. I think some of the studio work on here is awesome too. Like just that, I love that really hard organ kind of sound at the beginning of Children in Bloom. Um, there's a lot of stuff I really like about this record. It's just not quite as good as my favorite album of 1993. So number two, Recovering the Satellites. All right, the top two. And throughout the years, I have flip-flopped these more times than you can count. Basically a tie, but I've always gone back and forth and I've never really settled, but I guess I'll have to settle today. My number two is going to be August and Everything After, which Joe's right. I don't really normally love T-Bone, but pre-working with Robert Plant and Alison Krauss, I think his production was a lot better. Ever since that record, I feel like people just ask him to do that sound and it's kind of cookie cutter at this point. But back in the early 90s, I think his production was pretty good. I think this record sounds really good. There's a little too much crack on the snare. It's got that really tight snare, which was a very 90s thing uh, that I'm not that big of a fan of. But other than that, I think this record sounds great. Uh, It's worth noting that you've got a different drummer on this record, Steve Bowman, who left after this and was replaced with Ben Mize. This, like I said, I got this record when I was really young, third, fourth grade, somewhere around there. And I listened to it a ton. I was obsessed with it. Probably one of the first records of this style that I ever really listened to. Prior to this, I pretty much listened exclusively to classic rock. So it's kind of the first time I listened to music that was this quiet at times. And I think it really just opened me up to a lot of different stuff, really shaped my taste in music. I love it. I think Joe's completely wrong about the middle tracks on this record. Perfect Blue Buildings, Anna Begins, Time and Time Again are the best tracks on it. I think they're amazing. Great writing, great performances. The band is great on it. It's a perfect record. It might be a top 10, if not top 10, probably top 20 record of all time for me, which means that they probably have two records in my top 20 because I still got one ahead of this. Uh, August and everything after number two. Uh, Yeah. Covering the Satellites. Uh, I guess I forgot a little bit how good this album is. My forgetfulness will manifest itself in 1996. Um, I'll be in the comments lamenting my choices on Friday. However, let's talk about this record. I disagree with Kramzer. I think Catapult is great. I love sort of the alternative sheen that the the whole album has. It's a little more my style than um, the little more low-key August and everything after. You know, it's not, you know, we're not talking about like a Matchbox 20 record or anything here. You know, the guitar's a little beefed up. It had, like, it's very mid-90s esque like you can really kind of feel the 90s uh in this album long december one of my all-time favorites one of my early 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 favorite songs Uh, the the lyrics growing up sort of as a teenager you know you're kind of in that emo phase a little bit the self-pity uh so that one always spoke to me about reason to believe maybe um this year will be better than the last uh, always kind of struck me as poignant. And other than that, I mean, I just, there's no bad songs on this album. It moves through the track list so well. It never sort of wanes. There's no, you know, for me, not liking sort of the slower stuff on August and everything after. This one just goes right through the track listing. Uh, a lot of, you know, forward momentum. And I think the the song's a little bit less about Duritz's lyrics, a little bit more about the band, which I'm always going to sort of gravitate to that kind of, you know, style of music. So it's just a really great album. And uh, yeah, just uh, even even better than I, I thought. This one for me is sort of a clear number one and uh, it's growing on me even more and more as we, we've we done this uh, Cannon Crows discography. All right. Uh, my number one is August and Everything After, my favorite album of 1993. This album, first off, it's a total mood album. You cannot be really riding high and having fun with your friends and be like, yo, let's put on August. And, you know, it's not there for that. It's about 
feeling, that feeling of, you know, lovesick and desperation and loneliness and self-pity, all these things that we said are so true. And your head is just like wrapped in a bubble of that and nothing else on the outside even exists. You're just so engulfed in this misery and it works. It's a very sulky, mopey record, but it's done so well. Everyone has been in that space in their life, most likely. And this one illustrates those vibes better than most albums ever can. Round Here is a great opener, even though we, me and Joe disagree famously on the middle funky section, which I could do without, but I still love the song. And Omaha, my least favorite song on it, um, but still like it. I think it's just got too much of a country vibe when the rest of the album to me has like a lonely walking in a rainy city kind of vibe. Uh, Mr. Jones is great. Middle album is the heart and soul of it from Perfect Blue Billings through Sullivan Street for me. It's interesting because almost all of these songs are kind of like ballads and not necessarily slow, but definitely low key and saturated in you. But the album itself doesn't really move in like a sluggish pace. I think there's a lot of different intensities to each album or each song, especially in the middle with like Anna Begins, Time and Time Again, Rain King. They all have like this just fascinating, like mesmerizing intensity to it, um, which I really like. I think this is clearly his best lyrical album, even though it is the most dirty and the most whiny. It's to me, that's the most artistic and the most authentic that he gets, which is why it's really good. Um, I think Murder of One is a brilliant album closer, not just for the quality of a song being at the very end, but I think it kind of wraps up the mood and ends on like a little bit of a high note and cheerfulness, which I think brings the whole album together. I think it's one of the all-time best album closers. I got no complaints about this. I think it is a perfect album. And yeah, it is a... I, I like recovering a lot and I like this desert life, but this was never not going to be number one for me. All right. My number one, recovering the satellites. But like I said, you could ask me on it any different day and potentially get a different answer. I like this and August and everything after a ton. So this one, like Joe said, a bit of a rougher sound, a little heavier I remember hearing Angels of the Silences as the first single on the radio before the record was released and just being shocked. Didn't sound anything like August and everything after to me. I couldn't believe it was the Counting Crows. Um, so it, it is a, a departure. Gil Norton comes in to produce, who's a great producer. He's probably most well known for doing Doolittle by the Pixies. So he's really adept at sort of bringing that little extra bit of guitar energy into the band. They try a lot of different things on this record. I feel like this record sounds a little bit like it was difficult to make. You can kind of feel like they're not exactly sure what to do after all of the mass ex massive unexpected success of August. There's kind of like these growing pains on the record, but they kind of just like thrash their way through it and come out the other end of it sounding awesome. You know, it opens with the Mellotron on catapult and then you get these really heavy tremolo guitars. You've got these big Beatle-esque strings on I'm Not Sleeping. There's a really heavy B3 organ on some tracks on Children in Bloom and Have You Seen Me Lately. I just think it's really, really masterfully well put together. It sounds great. It's kind of amazing to me. It got pretty lukewarm reviews when it came out. And I remember reading reviews of This Desert Life when that came out and people saying that that was the record that they should have followed August with, but I think it's aged incredibly well. I think it sounds so good. The songwriting is amazing. Maybe after the success of August, people were just maybe wanting to hate on Duritz a bit. Maybe uh, they had heard Mr. Jones one too many times or something. I'm not sure, but this record is tremendously underrated, and uh, I will likely be talking about it on Friday again. Yeah, good call where... Like, it, the whole album works, but it does seem like they're a little unsure of themselves at times. It kind of sounds like this should have been the first album, and then August should have been the second, if you know what I'm talking about. Like, there's a yeah. bond and, and, like, a youthful energy to this one. It, it, yeah, definitely, you know, could have been a sophomore slump, but I think it's just, they were just so good, and it works. Sometimes these records that are a little bit disjointed and a little all over the place still work in spite of themselves. Uh, we've talked about other records like that on the channel. The White Album's a little like that, and there's other examples, but this is kind of one of those records where it's it's not necessarily a completely like cohesive experience, but it 
still still functions as a as a piece of art and a singular record. We haven't talked much about the drumming on these albums, but I do think that Steve Bauman on the first album is the best. I think he accents the song so well on that. Um, but you know, the drumming is never bad. But that's one of the main things that elevates August for me is the, that rhythm section with the original lineup. I uh, I go Ben Mize. I think he's the their best drummer. Yeah, you can't get wrong. Steve Bowman's good. Matt Malley too, under underrated bass player. I think he's great. That's that's why I love hanging around so much. The bass line's killer. Maybe he'll make an appearance when we recap the nineties and do our fantasy bands. Who knows? Tough competition in the nineties. That's true. A lot of really good bassists in the nineties. A lot of unheralded great bit bass players. I'm also uh, very interested to see how this video does for us, how many views we get, and what kind of the comments are like. In the 93 video, when we had, we all, all three of us had August on our list, it was kind of mixed. There were some people that were on board with it that thought it was a masterpiece, and a, lo a lot of comments that, you know, I saw one person call it lame, and that comment got a few thumbs up. So uh, I don't know what, uh, what our viewers think really of Counting Crows, but I'm interested. Let us know below. Let us know how you rank them and uh, be sure to hit the like button, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and check down in the description for links to all of our social media accounts. And we will be back tomorrow with our top 10 favorite songs of the Counting Crows and we will see you then. Thanks for watching.